The most important thing now is not what scientists think about animism. Uh, it's getting the sense that we're inside a great living creature out into the general public, that it's okay to feel uh, what you feel in the forest, that what you feel or what you intuit in the forest or out in nature or by the sea actually is telling you something genuine about the world. That the way the light falls on a Norwegian lake or the feelings you have in the mountains when you're just making your campfire at dusk and you look out onto the horizon lit up with stars, that all of that is a genuine form of communication from the earth, that the earth is actually speaking to you. That's the most important thing for us to learn now as a culture. It's very important for the scientists to do their science, and I wish they would do it in a more animistic spirit. But it doesn't matter if they don't take it on board. It's more important for the general public to take this on board. Mm. I don't like the word animism, by the way, but anyway, it's the only word we've got. I can't think of another one. It sounds too much like a cult or um, a dogma, which it isn't. Mm. And soul world? Soul, world? yeah, and soul the world, because anima mundi means, we didn't say this, did we? Anima mundi means soul of the world in Latin. In Greek, the expression was psyche cosmu, the psyche of the cosmos. That was translated by somebody or other in the Roman world into anima mundi, the soul of the world. So we need to re ensoul the world through telling stories, Scient animated or animistic, I would say, scientific stories. It's as if we steal into the, uh, we go into the science department at night when there, there, no scientists are around and we, we get some of their scientific papers. We, we steal their papers and we walk out uh, with these papers and then we breathe life into them. We animate them with soul. We breathe soul into them and release them into the general zeitgeist of the times. And we, we allow people once again to speak of rocks and atmosphere and carbon and sulfur and all the other things as sentient, as alive. And, the, and that we help people to realize that it's all right to participate with the moonlight on a lake, that it actually is full of meaning and communication. This is what we need. This is the, the deep inner change that we need. Because without that, we won't have the motivation to make the necessary sacrifices and changes. If we don't take on this more soulful approach to the world, the world will force it upon us through wiping out our civilization. This current civilization, with its emphasis on suicidal growth, simply cannot continue. I mean, a five-year-old child is capable of seeing that. Economists aren't, for some peculiar reason. Economists would say that it costs like 5% in the long term of the current GDP mm. to counteract the negative influences or the negative external externalities yes. of current ongoing growth. Yes. I don't believe economists are ready to jump onto the animistic bandwagon just yet, but you think they have to? No, I don't think they have to. I'd be quite happy if they, if they used that 5% GDP to start putting sulfate aerosols in the air or try Jim Lovelock's solution of shallow pipes in the oceans. That would be absolutely fine. They don't have to be animistic. Maybe this animism is just my own predilection. I don't want to be a dogmatist, you know. I mean, I have to remember Arnie Ness and be pluralistic. So I, I don't want to go around converting everyone to animism. I'm just sharing my, my own perspective. But a, a mechanist could just as well implement the right solutions. 5% um, isn't much. It means that instead of something costing 100 kroner, it'll cost 105 kroner. I mean, that's a small price to pay for saving the earth. Many people feel it's um, too expensive and that uh, if we do the growth now, there will be even more money to use for redeeming these or reversing these changes la later on because mm, mm. growth goes on t until people are have actually wealthy enough to do these changes. Mm, uh, but, mm. but what that point misses is the fact that, uh, is the point about the time scales mm. and the almost certain certainty of abrupt shift in the climate. So we won't, before we get anywhere near reaching that level of wealth, were it possible to do so, of course, because it's premised on extracting ever more resources or wild molecules from the earth. But even long before we could reach that level of growth, the climate system would have collapsed into a hot, dry state in any case. So we have to act now. There's no other option but to act right now, immediately. And by the way, I should add that simply putting aerosols into space or... Um, using Lovelock's shallow pipes 
is not enough, of course. Um, certainly not the aerosol solution, because we'll still have carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, which will acidify the oceans. So we're still going to have to reduce our CO2 levels. Well, I, I might go further than Jim Lovelock when talking about holistic science, because he means more interdisciplinarity, which is a good thing, you know, chemists talking to biologists, etc. But I take it a bit further. I think what we need to do in science now is put together quantities with qualities. Because in science we made a separation between the two. We said the only thing that counts is what can be counted. And anything that cannot be counted or measured doesn't exist, i.e. the qualities don't exist. The qualities are, as we said before, the feelings and intuitions you have when you're in the forest. These can't be quantified, but you feel them. We've been taught to disregard those and disbelieve them. And that I think we need to create a science in which the qualities are given as much weight as quantities. And we're doing this at Schumacher College, where I work, where we have a master's degree in holistic science, where we explore how we can put these two together. So, for example, we'll work with uh, the mathemat mathematics of Daisy World, or we'll make a carbon cycle model, but at the same time, we'll work with Goethe's science and his intuitive approach to plants and to phenomena. And we'll try and put the two together so that our students then become able to use reason when reason is required, but also to use feeling, sensing and intuition when they are required. So they develop all these four ways of knowing in themselves as equally as possible. And then you don't have thinking anymore. You have thinking, feeling simultaneously. So then you end up with a science that's, that's fundamentally ethical, that will not do certain things because they're unethical, so, such as certain kinds of genetic manipulation uh, or certain kinds of vivisection would not be done by scientists because the scientists would feel the unethical nature of such activities. At the moment in science, anything that can be done is done in the name of science, irrespective of the ethical implications. Scientists are not trained in ethics. They're not trained in philosophy either. They're just trained to be good servants of the mechanistic metaphor. So in holistic science, we try to heal that mistake by focusing on qualities, the qualities of things, these undefinable but nonetheless real communications from, from the world of meaning. We combine that with our quantitative approaches to the world as well. Well, the, the air is in some sense, you could think of it as a, as a sentient creature in its own right, uh, one of the organs of Gaia. That's like our skin is sensitive to touch, so might the air be sensitive to our words. Uh, maybe the air is listening to us in some sense, uh, not in the sense that human ears hear, but nevertheless in some mysterious way carrying our words and thoughts into itself around the world. But it is actually carrying our words in waves, isn't it? Yes, that's right, it does, yeah. It mediates, that's right. Without, without air we can, can't have sound. Mm. So the traditional peoples of the world have always spoken of the air as a kind of spirit that connects everything. So um, this gives us a more meaningful approach to the air, which is not in any, the slightest bit against or contradicts the scientific, our scientific understanding of the air. Not at all. In fact, the two mutually enhance each other. Mm. I mean, how wonderful to know that the air is 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, etc., etc., you know, to actually know how many of these chemical personalities there are zipping around in the air right here. Mm. But also to feel that the air has these more magical, mysterious qualities of perhaps a sort of memory or a, a, a soul that connects the whole world. Mm. The two are completely consistent with each other.